Welcome, everyone. I'm really glad that you're joining us. It's a Monday night at 6 p.m. You all are rock stars. We are here for managing conflict strategies for the personal, professional, and beyond. It is one of the six workshops for the Shape Mini Certificate. If you're interested, go to shape.colostate.edu. We are going to go ahead and get started. I have put a link in the chat if you want to join us. Um, via the website we also have this qr code so if you are on a computer and you want to click that qr code uh, you can also go to the menti that third option there but i would say the qr code and the website are going to be the fastest options to get to where we're going once most of you are there go ahead and click that that uh, heart button for me just so i can get a gauge of knowing that folks are there and have joined us All right, I see some folks, <clears throat> other folks might be listening on. So here we go. What we're going to do today is we're going to define conflict, some different uh, understandings of it, identify sources of conflict, as well as um, strategies to work through conflict. So it will be a fast hour. Glad you're here with us today. So to get us started off, I want you to share a word. When you think of the word conflict, think of like, you know, the quick association. I say conflict, you say, <laughs> put it into the mentimeter. This will be our first trial. Ooh, disagree, stress, yuck, disagreement, frustration, tension. I see that. Keep on going. Okay. Oh, fear. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's really <laughs> typical, right? Um, especially thinking about where and how we have learned about conflict in our lives, um, how present or prevalent it's been with us um, and what it's been used for. So I think oftentimes we think of um, uh, the the tension, the disagreement, that like funny feeling in your stomach that's like, oh God, this is the worst. Um, or maybe it's like letting off steam in that really negative way of like, I'm just going to like curse someone out and think that I'll feel better afterwards, but really I don't, and all of that. Conflict also is a change agent. What happens with conflict is that it can operate as um, a motivator. It shifts things from one to another. How we manage conflict helps to define if that shift is going to be positive and effective or negative and ineffective. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Successful leaders manage conflict. They don't shy away from it or suppress it, but see it as an engine of creativity and innovation. The challenge for leaders is to develop structures and processes in which such conflicts can be orchestrated productively. Conflicts are bound to rise, right? Miscommunications happen all the time, especially when we are in such multifaceted, multicultural, uh, multidimensional worlds. Virtual, in-person, texting communication, email, on the phone, all of it, across the miles, different time zones. Are you tired, hungry, angry, cranky? All of that is going to feed into how we move through conflict together. So that's going to be part of our later part of the workshop when we talk about strategies to manage conflict. But first, where do we learn our responses to conflict? So, right, you had some some feels come up, <laughs> some some words come up in the association. Where do we learn our responses to conflict? Who do we see or model it around? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Keep them coming. Yes. So I'm seeing parents um, pretty, pretty strongly, right? Maybe caregivers, whoever were prominent adults in and around you during formative years. Um, family, friends, teachers, hmm, our supervisors. Ooh, I like that someone said good supervisors. So modeling maybe what you want to be and learning our positive responses from that, bosses, teachers, and media. So I think that's really strong, right? We think of the playground as, as some of uh, our first breeding grounds for conflict and how and when, what is put up with, what is um, modeled, um, is 
yelling and disciplinarian, it's gentle parenting, all of these things come into it. And so we bring these in with, with us to the workplace. Conflict is cultural and so are our responses. They are socialized, meaning that society evolves around us or it doesn't evolve, society exists around us and we are just sponges soaking up all of these messages and whatever is around us, right? Because that might uh, be distinguished racially, ethnically, um, different regions of the US, of the continental United States, of different countries across the world. So we look at our families, our peers, our work, our social, our school, and our experiences in media. You hit them all. Very nice. We are going to look at a few different styles of managing conflict. And this is based on um, multitudes of research and there's a conflict inventory that if you wanna deep dive into your own personal conflict style, um, the Conflict Resolution Center, I believe will do it and potentially the Career Center. But we're just gonna do a high level understanding of these five different styles of communication or of conflict. So in the upper left quadrant, we have high degree of cooperativeness, co cooperativeness <laughs> and a lower degree of assertiveness. And that's going to be our accommodations or smoothing out, right? These are our peacekeepers, our harmony. They play down the conflict and seek harmony among all parties. Then we go lower on the degree of cooperative, but, but also low on assertiveness. And that's where we find our assertive or our avoidance and withdraw. We might deny the existence of conflict, um, hide one's true feelings, not address it directly at all if ever <laughs> and maybe just wait till it goes away <clears throat> if it does oftentimes it's like a wound it'll just fester right so then we go on the high assertiveness low cooperativeness so that's going to be the bottom right hand corner as you see it on the screen and that's going to be our competition or authority authoritative command so this might be forcing a solution to impose one's will on the other party right? Low cooperative, high assertive. This is going to be um, more directly addressing the situation and being more forceful about one's own position with it. Um, in the middle, in that yellow box, in the middle, we have compromise. And this might be bargaining for gains and losses to each party. This might be an example of, um, well, if you give me this, then I'll give you this. Not all of us are getting our wants, but maybe we'll get our needs met. And then ideally, if we have probably a good amount of time, a good amount of awareness, um, and some skills to move through this, what we have in the upper right-hand quadrant is collaboration or problem solving. Now, this searches for a solution that meets each other's needs holistically. Um, while this might be the ideal outcome, it does take a lot to get there and is not to be expected all of the time. Right. But as we look at this, I want you to think about for yourself where you might see yourself in terms of um, a work context or in terms of a family context. Maybe that's very different. I show up at work differently than I show up at home. Um, I show up in different spaces depending on the context. I also, we've talked a little bit about power in some of our other workshops. I show up differently depending on the rung of the ladder in the hierarchy I might be, right? I might feel like I have more possibility to address things um, if I have different agency into a space. So I want you to think about for yourself, as we've talked about accommodating and smoothing, avoidance or withdraw, competition, compromise, and collaboration, where might you fall? Just rhetorically, think about that for yourself. And if you're thinking to yourself, anything other than avoidance, <laughs> studies show that 80% of the continental US goes to avoidance first, right? And I wanna say like, I have an accommodating sometimes, a collaborative sometimes, a compromise sometimes, but I might avoid it at the beginning, right? I might just like wanna not address it. And with my partner, um, who's very different than me, we have a different style around that, so we have to meet each other. Okay, so that's a little bit of the context of the five styles. Any questions, what questions are out there before I move along? And welcome to the person who just joined us, I think, Catherine, hello. Here is the um, Mentimeter link if you would like to join us. All right, type those questions into the chat. I have it up if you need it and we'll continue.
All right. So here we have an example of a possible conflict. <laughs> Angry says, clean up the effing sink. <laughs> this is um, a picture directly from a conflict resolution center, and it's one of their favorites they use in their presentations. Um, so if you were to think of how assertive and cooperative is angry toast, right? Remember, those are the those are the axes that we're on in terms of the five different styles. Um, what would you think are how assertive is it and how cooperative is it? Go ahead back to Mentimeter. All right. For a few more seconds. All right. So we definitely have a bit of a consensus from the eight. It looks like we might have ooh, one over and not very, very assertive. Um, but most of the point, oh, a lot assertive. Interesting. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm so curious because these can be such subjective words in terms of like what assertiveness looks like. Um, and then cooperative, lots and lots of agreement that it is not very cooperative. It's like <laughs> pretty, maybe aggressive in language, assertive in language, um, and but not necessarily a direct one-to-one -one altercation, but a very clear message, um, but passed through the messenger of angry toast. So also maybe a little lighthearted, hard to know the context around the situation. Okay, good first start. Which style best describes angry, to angry toast's approach to conflict? Competitive, avoidance, collaborate. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, collaborate, compromise, or accommodate. Ooh, okay. Stuff is all over the place. It's all windows. Okay. All right. So we've got some, some towards competitiveness and some towards avoidance, right? So maybe the avoidance. Um, anyone want to be brave? I mean, we've got 11 of us here. Anyone want to come off, off mute and say maybe why avoidance? Or put it into the chat. The chat can be safer. <laughs> Ooh, we're like tied between competitive and avoidance. I didn't choose avoidance, but I can see where that would be an interpretation in that there was a sign put up as opposed to speaking directly to the offender as such. Charlene, that's a great point. And I think we also really consider what the receiver is going to receive best. Um, and so that might have been a strategic move on the person's part to say they're not going to be uh, positively approached if I directly address it. Um, so I'm going to use a different mechanism of it. What Charlene said, more passive aggressive than assertive. Yeah, I would agree. Um, maybe a little competitive in terms of like the, um, but we didn't see necessarily the other side of it, right? That competition of it. But if we go back to our competition, it's forcing a solution to impose one's will on the other party. So I would agree that that falls into that category as well. If we look at the avoidance, um, it's design, denying the existence of a conflict and hiding one's true feelings. So more passive aggressive. I really like how we landed there. All right. Moving right along. Okay, I'm going to skip this one because we have a few of them and it's already 20 minutes in. Okay. Don't eat my noodles. <laughs> Love, Sydney. Stop using that filter and add no paper. Again, we've got some, uh, <laughs> some post-it note communication, as we'll talk about. Which style best describe the roommate's approach? Is it competition, avoidance, collaborate, accommodate, or compromise? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm coming. We will show the correct answer in five, four, three, two, one. Yes, it is both competitive and avoiding. Again, because of that, not a direct communication. They were talking through a filter, <laughs> literally through a filter. I thought that was a funnier joke than other people might have, but 
So the coffee filter helps them talk through it. And we also might see this through lots of text message communications too. Okay, um, post-it note communication is something that uh, is an avoidant tactic or strategy. Um, and it can sometimes work and oftentimes not work, right? In terms of what you want as the best outcome to get there. So we're going to talk about what some of the best outcomes to get um, that you want are. And again, it does matter how you say it. <clears throat> and what to do, right? So there is another uh, workshop that we do on uh, feedback and conflict strategies that will take a deeper dive, but just remembering that it's not just what's happening in the moment, but the context around it. And um, researchers will say that nonverbal communication is much more, uh, is much more present than we think. Does anyone know the, the percentage breakdown? I'll tell you, 7% of what we communicate are the actual words. So when you look at that filter and you see the words, it communicates only 7% with I think 32% being your uh, cadence and then body language is missed altogether in it. So, so we don't necessarily really know the full picture of what's happening or even in a text message. Now we're starting to make all kinds of insinuations of like how long it takes to someone to respond, what those little dots mean, um, how you're signing off on things. Like there's so, there's so much, but how we say it matters just as much as what we say. Are you seriously vacuuming at 1.40 a.m.? You can see the zombies came from a collegiate setting, <laughs> less the professional setting, but we're going to go We're gonna go with the, the, the personal on it. I'm indeed vacuuming, but not too seriously. I've smiled a few times. I even did a booty shake. WTF, I'm not asking about your mood. It's late and disruptive. I'm almost done. Please stop. I have to be up at six. Imagine it's a sound machine. Whoosh, you're getting sleepy. Just stop. It's late and it's rude. So sleepy. Woo, messages not being received. <laughs> okay. Lessons to note. We are going to talk about um, a couple in this example, talking about, again, avoidance. So maybe talking through a medium instead of person to person in a um, active way. Um, I sometimes find that if I'm in an active way, that doesn't always provide the, the best response because I get all fluttered. We're going to talk about amygdala hijack. However, um, when you can and you practice some of these ways, it is really positive to, to come together one to one. There can be humor that's used and it can really miss the mark and escalate things fairly quickly. Um, Anytime we're communicating through a text, a group me, an email, things might be read through the, you know, between the lines that may or may not be there. Uh, it can get really messy really quickly. And then you can also consider about that delay send that if you are sending something, maybe respond when you are not angry, right? Delay, delay that send button because when we respond out of anger, um, what can happen is we can escalate the situation. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to talk about this amygdala hijack. Hang out with me in two minutes, for two minutes. We know you're really busy, so we're keeping it quick. It's the manager man yeah. or two. Yeah. We've all had conversations where we've left feeling like they just missed the mark. Why does this happen? Well, part of the reason has to do with our brain, specifically. What's the amygdala, you ask? It's only Sarah's favorite part of the brain. The amygdala is the part of the brain that is constantly scanning your environment for threats so that it can move you into action so it can protect you. Those threats might be physical, mental, emotional, or even to our ego. One of the ways I like to think about the amygdala is to imagine it's this shaky little neurotic chihuahua. It's shaking and it's nervous and it's ready to bark at anything that it perceives as a threat. Some of us have more neurotic chihuahuas than others. So what does any of this have to do with conversations? When our amygdala is triggered, it hijacks our brain. It pumps our body and our brain full of these chemicals to things like logic and reasoning, problem solving, listening, and empathy. Or when there's no way we can connect and build trust in the same way as when we're calm. So what do you do if you notice the amygdala has been hijacked and you or the other person? That is a really good time to step away, take a breath, and regroup when both parties have had a chance to breathe. Here's your challenge. I want you to do an amygdala audit. 
Think about a time when you had a stress response and think about what did it feel like when you were going through that? Because the more aware you are about your response, the more likely you can catch it when it's happening in the moment, or you're more likely to notice it in someone else. And remember, fully brave. Did you find this helpful? Likes? All right. So think of a time, maybe recently, that you had a neurotic chihuahua in your brain, you experienced a stress response. For you, what do you think about your chihuahua? How neurotic is it? <laughs> it is it pretty chill? Um, are you reasonably alert? Like you know your situations? Or, okay, I get, holy crap, what was that? That's going to be indication of a, a very fast, <laughs> very highly alert chihuahua. Yeah, it's really interesting because <clears throat> it can be hard to have some self-awareness around this in terms of um, like, except when we're in the moment, it almost takes being in the moment to pause and track and think back to what we're talking about in the workshop. So that's why I really like to, um, you know, reflect on some of the experiences that we have had, but really some of this might come to mind the next time that you feel activated. I really like this word activated in terms of like what activates you, what is that stress response that can um, move you towards some of this uh, feeling of being a neurotic chihuahua. So we have a, a good um, kind of balance. Uh, very few folks are like, you know, pretty chill. I would say that that's probably right, spot on, you know, amidst a, a pandemic, hopefully moving to endemic. Um, and thanks for answering in the chat too. I'm seeing both of them. So this is great. All right. So you're like, all right, we've talked a lot about this. Um, I want to know what fuels conflict for you. So do you have any hot buttons that you know are just going to get under your skin? You're not going to have um, a great response to? Take some time now. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. As folks are finishing up typing, I'm seeing my supervisor in her demands rather than requests. So it feeling very much like it's a one sided conversation. Um, Brene Brown, Dr. Brene Brown uh, talks a lot about this in Dare to Lead in terms of how we interact with team members uh, and how we paint the concept of done. So oftentimes supervisors will make demands <laughs> and not realize what goes into that. And then things are missed uh, if there isn't a, an awareness of the supervisor of what goes into that. Um, I can imagine that that's a, a hard experience. Interruption of other people. Ooh, that is that is one of mine too. Um, my partner comes from a very different background, um, is of a different race ethnicity, and um, interruption is a normalized part of communicative styles. And if you can't get in fast enough, you don't get in. Um, and this took me a long time to realize. And that's a whole nother one on communicative, uh, intercultural communication. Not being considered, kept in the loop. Yeah, that consideration, that feeling seen, um, considered, right? Being late and or lack of work ethic when the team is working hard. Ooh, that seems like such a powerful one in terms of like opportunity for maybe miscommunications or like perceptions of other folks. I love what folks are saying. Um, people who are aggressively and demanding instead of working together, overuse of privilege, that is a hot button. Micromanaging and lack of trust in my work, inconsistency and accusing accusatory tone assuming facts without knowing both sides of a situation, context and perspective are both important in any argument slash conversation. That, I, and the, so I'm insinuating from the exclamation point at the end that someone feels very passionately that context and perspective are both very important. Um, I hear you, I see you, I believe it as well. Being told the orders I am following from one faculty is wrong or different than the other faculty wants. Oh my goodness. And you being in the middle of that and feeling like you may or may not have agency to say, but this one wants this and this one doesn't. And you all need to talk together or maybe all of us need to talk in a room. That can feel really 
really frustrating. Thank you so much for um, contributing to that. So now we're gonna talk about some strategies and some things that can cool our conflict. Because the strategies, yes, are in a different workshop, but they are all, we're well, still gonna talk about them here in terms of what we can actively do. But first we have to focus on cooling ourselves, right? Saying, yes, Narada Chihuahua, I see you, I hear you, we're safe, we're okay. <laughs> How do we increase our self-awareness? Um, we're gonna talk about expectations. We're gonna talk about active listening, asking the right questions. Then we're going to talk about this concept of interests versus positions and how we can practice reframing some of these concepts. And then we're gonna generate solutions together. Okay. We are about at our halfway point. Context has brought us here. Now we're gonna focus on the management of conflict in the workplace. Are we ready? We good? Show me some show me some reaction buttons here. We good? I don't know if there's any questions. Okay. Oh, active listening. Be aware of. I have a thank you, Shirley. I have a um workshop that's literally just called Listen More, Ask More. I think so often we experience even supervisors, I myself can be like this, where we just talk, 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 make statements, statements, statements. There's so many periods and there's not a lot of listening and there's not a lot of asking of questions, right? And it's so easy to think about if we're on the, the ladder of the hierarchy, how we can um, think about how we're behaving up. And it's also really important to think about how we're behaving downward too. Are we asking more questions? Are we listening more when we're in conversation with our um, subordinates or supervisees? When we're thinking about active listening, how are we aware of body language? How are we aware of our tone? Of our eye contact when culturally appropriate? Um, and then empathy. Empathy is that um, perspective taking ability, right? That not knowing exactly maybe what someone is going through, but being in it with them um, and communicating some care for the person. You know, we talk a lot about customer service and like, what is the, what is customer service and customer service? And when you elevate it to customer care, when you care about the interaction, um, so often there was this great podcast um, on LifeKit about how to get what you want <laughs> from uh, customer service uh, representatives. And it talked all about this actually, right? How do we relate in? How do we be empathetic with the person on the other side of it? And it feels contradictory to, let me speak to your manager, right? It's the clutch go-to. How do we actively listen to what's going on and pick up on cues that can diffuse and deflect uh, conflict when we arise? How are we aware of our body language and maybe misconstruing? Um, I knew a couple of uh, colleagues, and I would say mentors of mine, who happen to be women of color, who felt really comfortable crossing their arms. And lots of folks will tell you crossing your arms is a closed off body position. It doesn't communicate an openness and willingness. And they felt that was unfair. <laughs> it was inaccurate. And sometimes they're cold and sometimes it's more comfortable for their body type, for their con So it's, it's understanding about body language and then also checking in on assumptions too. Thinking about your tone, your eye contact and empathy. Now we get to, right, we talked about the listen more. How do we ask the right questions? So many of us have probably heard the statement, seek first to understand, then to be understood, right? So when we first seek to understand, that might be checking in. That might be asking questions of, here's what I think you said. Um, did I get that right? What did I miss? Um, I think I'm understanding this. Let me check in. Um, tell me about the situation. What do you think caused the problem? How has this impacted you? All of those hopefully help you get to some of that empathy taking, some of that recognition of active listening, being present in it and defusing the situation. So asking some of the right questions. And sometimes people are not gonna be ready to answer this and you'd be like, nope, I'm done. I don't even wanna talk about it anymore. I gotta get away. And that's when you take a pause. You step away and you circle back to it later. Here is such an important concept that oftentimes I tend to forget but it can be so helpful in terms of how we frame what we want to communicate out of out the get, right? A position is a statement 
a demand, communicates wants. It's what someone thinks should happen. It's, it's kind of going out the gate with that. That's the position statement. When we think about interests, this is what's underneath. Our interests are the desires and concerns. So why does this person want or need this? What is the interest in it? What is actually at the core and crux of it? I recently got into a situation with my partner and it was, it was something that was very much on the surface and we were just throwing position statements at each other. I don't feel like you trust me because of this and this and this behavior. Well, if you would just do this and this and this behavior. And when I, honestly, I didn't do this in the minute, in the moment, I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't do this perfectly in the moment, hardly ever. But when I stepped back and I thought about this concept of position and interests and what we were doing versus what was motivating it, the interest that my partner had was to be kept in the loop, was to be communicated with and to not make decisions in isolation or solo, like I was just living my life alone, right? And when I could see and understand what that want and need was, I could understand more how to come back to her and approach it, um, apologize for the miscommunication, and so we can move on to be better. So when you think about position statements, we get caught up in a lot of demands and wants and the, what we think should happen, a lot of accusations sometimes. And when we go to interests, it's around that desires and concerns. So what or why does the person want or need this? So just think about this as we're going through our next activity. I want you to look at each of these statements and decide based on what we've talked about with position and interest, if each of them, which one each of those are. That was a poorly <laughs> stated sentence. Read the statements and decide if they are a position or an interest. I'll give you about 30 seconds. All right. Okay. Got seven folks. I'm going to give it a couple more seconds. All right, we are just welcoming someone in who I think has been in before. Welcome. I'm going to put the Mentimeter in the chat. You can click on it. We are looking at statements and deciding if they are positions or interests. Okay, so the first one we have, um, we waited a little bit longer and we got some different averages, as you can see. So five folks thought that it was strongly a position and then still in the position. And then three of them felt like it was over in an interest. So the teacher sucks, I deserve an A. When we go back to our position or interest, position, our statements, demands, wants, what someone thinks should happen. So if we look at that, um, whoop, that statement, the teacher sucks, I deserve an A, I would say strongly <laughs> a statement and what they think should happen. I'm worried that our landlord will find out you're not on a lease and we will get kicked out. Ooh, this is looking more like, so a couple people, one person was kind of in the middle, not quite sure maybe, or could see it as both. One person said it was a position um, and then four said it was the interest. So if we look at the interest, that is a desire and concern. Why does a per person want or need this? So again, that communicating of the why, um, then we will all get kicked out. Uh, that communicates an interest in terms of what we don't want happening. Um, so it wasn't saying you need to leave right now because you're not on the lease. That would be a position. 
the interest statement communicates the why. If you have questions about that, come off mute or, or into the chat. If I don't get an A, I will lose my scholarship. So this is an interesting one. We said a couple of people thought that it was a position. It is a statement. Um, and then four folks said it was an interest. What's at the crux of it is that is that why that is presented there. Right? It is so in the in the chat it said it's different, it's difficult when there's no voice inflection. You're right. And I don't know how how these would have been been said, and it's how we think about them, and we we think about them totally in different ones, right? So yeah, the I'm worried our landlord will find out you're not on the lease, and we'll all get kicked out. That might be still an interest statement but it might not have that how that context the, the how we said it um might be a little a little harsher right um and if i don't get an a i'll lose my scholarship can feel very different than well if i don't get an a i'm gonna lose my scholarship right there might be some different empathy building in it what's hard about it is there can be cultural connotations in it as well. And so we tend to operate in a very um, Western, very white um, communicative styles of approachability. And so much of the conflict styles, even that are present in this workshop, um, kind of look to that. But this concept and research around positions and interests are kind of across the board. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, if I don't lose my scholarship. So this, I would argue, um, does verge on the line of interest because it is that um, the why of it, I will lose my scholarship. And then finally, I hope you all can still hear me. It said low system. If you don't stop parking on the street in front of our house, I'll tell the landlord you're living here. Yeah, so this got an average um, of more towards position. And again, if we look at position, it's what we think should happen, demands or wants. Right, so it's not um, when you um, park on the street, then da 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 happens. It concerns me because it's if you don't do this, I'm going to do that. So making the demands on what you think should happen. Great. So our averages fell out correctly. Position, interest, interest, position. Nice job. When we reframe something. We restate to capture the essence of what's said. We remove personal attacks and turn a position into an interest. That can be difficult to do as evidenced in the exemplified fight that my partner and I had where I could not do this in the moment, right? It takes difficulty and practice to be able to take a breath, restate what you heard, right? That active listening asking some questions is this what i'm understanding i'm really trying to kind of get to the get to the protein here um remove personal attacks and turn a position into an interest so we're gonna we're gonna practice how to do this i think in the next slide so reframe reframe this statement my boss is a complete micromanager they hired me where is the trust okay so that is a position statement how might we reframe that from the why of the wants and needs of this person. I'll be watching the chat too. Mm. 
All right, let's try some of these out. That's why I like Mentimeter also, because it's totally anonymous. So what we've seen so far. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with, I was hired for the particular position and I would like the opportunity to show you how I can do it. Um, I like that statement of the why um, being in there, more of like an, an interest in being able to demonstrate skill. When my boss asks a lot of questions, I get the feeling they don't feel like I can do my job. So that really gets to, I hear, I hear the um, insinuation, like that want there, that, that uh, the why behind it, if, if you can notice that. Um, when my boss micromanages me, it makes me feel like they don't trust me. They hired me and I would like them to trust me. So yeah, that gets to some of the, um, I like, it's definitely less assertive potentially than this up here. They hired me, where's the trust? Um, I would like them to trust me, right? I, maybe I'd like the opportunity to earn their trust. Um, we do another workshop on trust building, breaking and repairing. Um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting, especially when we've had previous relationships or previous experiences that inform, right? I want my boss to, boss to trust me, but I'm feeling micromanaged. Oh, I like that one. It kind of restates it in the opposite. Um, and then that might open up some opportunity for questions around, well, what does micromanage look like to you, right? My boss does not seem to trust me and I feel micromanaged. I would appreciate if my boss trusted me. I really hate this example. I would appreciate if my boss trusted me to do more work. Nope, it's just gonna keep scrolling. When my boss asks a lot of questions, nope, I'm sorry, y'all. This format of this question is one of the more frustrating ones. My boss is micromanaging me because they need to have things done a specific way, but I wish they would trust me to complete my projects so I can prove myself. Ooh, I really like this one. This one really gets to the why behind it um, and the desire of the person and isn't um, just dictatorial around what should happen, right? It would make me feel better if you showed more trust in my work. Ooh, I like that. Um, kind of make that, it feels like more <clears throat> position statement, but it, um, I think if you added the why to it, it would shift to the interest, right? Because it's again, a differently stated um, position statement. It would make me feel better if you showed more trust in my work. That's like what you think should happen. And if you add the interest to it, um, then we can build a relationship where you don't feel like you need to check on me all the time and we can work more efficiently together, right? Or it would be ideal if my previous work experience and aptitude was valued in a way that promoted trust. An overbearing manager shows me that there isn't confidence in the work I complete. Yes. <laughs> this, this feels like a very powerfully worded, um, like insert to an, a, a year end evaluation, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I'm just imagining what this conversation would be like specifically like with the person. And that's not how it was written to be fair. So I will give it to this person, whoever wrote this. Um, I really like that they brought in the, the previous work experience and valued in a way that promoted trust. Um, overbearing can be a, a, a word, like what they call a blur word, which is more subjective rather than like the behavior and right. So what, what does this manager do that might be? And the same can be said about micromanaging, right? Like what that can look a lot of different ways. Okay, we didn't go through all of them. There is another one in the chat that I want to highlight. If I can scroll to it. I don't like being micromanaged by my boss. I was hired to do a job and would like them to trust me to do it. Yes, yeah. So looking at that again, a bit more of the statement and the um, interest position really gets to the why behind it, right? Um, so why do we want to be trusted? Why do we want to do our work, maybe not in isolation, but with more trust? What will it get towards? What will it work towards? The interest position really gets us to the why. Okay. Great practice. So finally, we come to this concept of generating solutions. So highlighting, whoop, let's see. When we are able to highlight common ground, when we start with the easier issues, and when we know our best and worst alternatives. So generating solutions, I just did this the other day um, when I was working through someone who had a conflict that um, was between this person and someone else. And so we talked through what are all of the possible solutions? And I'm talking solutions that didn't even feel like it was on the table. Like one of the solution was, 
Well, could you lie about it and say that this isn't going to happen anymore? And the person was like, I don't, I don't think so. I was like, but is it a, is it a possibility? And they're like, well, yes. Maybe not the most ethical one, not the one they want to chose to. But when you generate all of these possibilities and solutions, you can see that there are better <laughs> and worse alternatives to the things that are happening. Sometimes we can get really stuck in the either or thinking, right? This dichotomous thinking of, well, either this is going to happen or this is going to happen. There is oftentimes a third way or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, right? So how do you highlight the common ground in terms of, listen, I know we don't see eye to eye all the time. Kurt. Just kidding. I really like Kurt because he's come to a lot of my workshops. And, uh, <laughs> um, but you're on my screen, so we're gonna we're gonna play a little, right? And I know that you care about the place we work, and I care about the place we work. And while that might seem like it communicates differently, I can trust that you really care about the work that you're doing, and I think that that is behind a lot of even some of our conflict, right? So what is a common ground? Even if you're like really kind of reaching, it does and it can build even a teetery bridge, you can start to build a foundation on. And then starting with the easier issues, right? Um, we talk about feedback strategies before of like, what is specific behavior? What, what can we identify and work towards? Um, so starting with maybe the easier issues and one at a time, as opposed to building, 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 building. Right? Have you ever been in a place? It's like, well, you did this, but you did this, but you did this, but you did this. It was like on that coffee filter, right? I at made an ask, and they're like, don't use my coffee filters. And it's like, okay, was it was it about that, or was it about something else? That was competition, right? They were competing for it. But how do we start with the easier issue? And then how do we know again our best and worst alternatives? Um, my best friend, one of the best uh, gifts she ever gave me was a yellow legal pad. She's like, write out your pros and cons, write out your options, write out all of this. Because a lot of times conflict, it can be that like continuing seeping undercurrent of ick. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you come into that room and you're like, this kind of sucks, right? So a lot of managing conflict is around that self-awareness of yourself. What are the best and worst alternatives for you? What could be some of the easier issues? What could be some common ground that you can access when dealing with or working with this person. If you are going to be viewed as a leader in your organization, you must develop your own conflict approach and develop a reputation for leadership and conflict management and consensus building, right? Consensus building works us towards that collaboration, works us towards that last piece of getting everybody's needs met and working towards the, the most possible, um, most beneficial answer for the organization and for the people involved. That does not mean that we are going to all sing Kumbaya and be best friends at the end of that. And that is all right. That is not what is being asked of us. When we are working on complex issues, issues that are wicked problems that just, um, you know, kind of go on and on and on. And there's lots of things happening in our personal and professional life. We are wrought for conflict. So thinking about self-awareness, thinking about asking the right questions, listening more, considering positions or interest, and then generating solutions together. When you think about all of these and you think about the five different styles, reflect on your own and think about something where you might be able to use some of this workshop in a situation or scenario that you are managing on your own. With five minutes left, that brings us to the attendance. If you will click this QR code, it will bring you to a form. This one is managing conflict in the workplace. I have also put the attendance link into the chat. I'm going to stop the recording and say thanks to everyone and answer any questions if there is one. Bye recorders.